I deliberately titled it Negotiating with Iran. I did not title it uh, Negotiating with the Islamic Republic uh, because I wanted to look at history. And to look at history, I look at four case studies of Iran and its negotiating actions. Two of these case studies are pre-revolution, two are post-revolution. And my assumptions are, too, that there are certain th things that hold constant, whether the ruler of Iran is a shah or a supreme leader, whether it's a monarchy or an Islamic republic. Um, and the other is that there are things that we can learn from history about what worked um, and perhaps what didn't work. In a, in a negotiation, one should t be sure that you're talking to the right people. Um, in an Iranian setting, and particularly a setting of the Islamic Republic, uh, this is not always easy or obvious um, because uh, the system or the word that many experts use to describe the government system of the Islamic Republic are words like uh, opaque, uh, and murky and um, unclear. Uh, and then when one is in the room with an Iranian counterpart, uh, there are ghosts in the room. Uh, there are ghosts of 1953 and the American-British coup that overthrew Mossadegh. There are ghosts of the Shah. Uh, there are ghosts of people like uh, Morgan Schuster and Howard Baskerville, people may not have heard of these names, but these are, um, these are names in a very earlier period of Iranian history. There are the ghosts of the Treaty of Turkoman Chai of 1827, which imposed humiliating conditions um, on, um, on Iran. And all those ghosts are present. It isn't that one has to know all of the details of all of these names or places that I mentioned. But when you're there, you should, you should be aware that those ghosts are there and they are going to affect the way your Irani the Iranian side or your Iranian counterpart um, it will, approach the will approach the negotiation. You know, 30 years ago uh, when I was uh, doing time in Iran as what Mark Bowden called a guest of the Ayatollah, I had a, I had a brief meeting with um, uh, the man who is now the supreme leader, with um, Ayatollah Khamenei. At that time, he was the Friday prayer leader of Tehran. He came to, he came to visit us. I would love the opportunity uh, to sit down and talk with him again and about some of the issues raised in this book. A number of people have asked put the question to me this way. They said, look, with what, with what happened to you um, and with the way you and your colleagues were treated in the outrageous, in this, in this most outrageous event, uh, how can you talk about negotiation? Um, and I have two responses. One is, uh, in my view, negotiation or dialogue is, does not is not the equivalent of surrender or appeasement, uh, although many people see it that way. Um, I don't think it. I don't think it is. Um, and second, on a personal note, what happened to me during those fourteen months was was difficult. It was frightening in many uh, in many ways. It was um, outrageous in the sense of. Iran ignore uh, and the, those in authority in Iran ignoring their own obligations under centuries of international practice uh, but it was 14 months and my ties to Iran go much deeper than that they go back about 45 years uh, and so 14 months out of 45 years uh, over the long term is is not that much and most of my contacts most of my experience uh, with that very, very special place um, has been very positive. And I have great admiration for the country. I have great admiration for the people. Look what they have had to put up with. 
over history. Look at the kind of governments they've had. Look at the kinds of leaders that they've had. And they have somehow kept their um, humanity, their creativity, their, inventive, their inventiveness, um, and, and uh, their sense of compassion and good humor. Iran is more than the absurdities of President Ahmadinejad or the nastiness uh, of the goons, this government and its goon squads and its bullies. And there's more there. And that's why, for example, many Iranians, and I don't know if Americans know this, but many Iranians, and not just um, exiled Iranians, but people in Iran, uh, see some of the pres uh, some of their president's statements as an embarrassment, and this came up during the presidential campaign. And they and they said, "Your rhetoric, what you are saying, is needlessly provocative. Does not serve the interests of the country, and you are going to drag us into a war that we do not need." And I would like people to sort of look at the country uh, perhaps a little bit deeper and get beyond the, um, the stereotypes and the demonization that has too long uh, characterized our relationship.